online, we see you. Welcome to the gathering. We're glad you're here. We invite us all to lift our voices, lift our hearts. It's great to be together. this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God still inside the storm the promise of the shore and I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves. When I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so why? you make there isn't one that is delayed so I will not lose heart here I will lift my arms and start to sing into the night my praise will call the sun to rise
is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So leave behind. And leave behind your regrets and mistakes.
went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn A sacrifice was made As the heavens rolled And all hail King Jesus All hail the Lord of heaven and earth All hail King Jesus And all hail the Savior of the world There was a moment, sing it.
God, we God, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the gift of life and love. We celebrate him today. God, we thank you for everything you're going to do today during this gathering, the way you're going to illuminate yourself, the way you're going to teach us something new, the way you're going to lead us and inspires and encourage us to, to continue on this journey that we have with you. God, I pray that, that each word that is spoken today from this platform points to you, points to your life. God, I pray that we walk out of this space, man, with a whole new mindset, that you transform us in some way today that allows us to illuminate your love to people around us. We carry your story, man, we carry the hope with us as a result of, of this experience we get to share together. God, we thank you for all that you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, say a quick hello to someone next to you. Find a seat. Welcome all the people online who decided to stay home in your nice warm slippers. <laughs> it's great to have you all. Um, I was on social media and I saw this deeply spiritual poem that I thought I would share with you all. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. Unless a leap year is its fate, February has 28. All the rest have three days more, excepting January, which has 6,184. <laughs> I just felt like that was very um, where we are right now. January has seemed like quite possibly the longest month in history. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it has been cold, it's been dark, and wow, good job on getting here this morning with all that ice. So one of the best ways, I just want to encourage you, we are going to be starting our winter groups here at the end of January. The kickoff will be January 28th. And the last fall, we had over 200 people in Cedar Hills who call Cedar Hills home join our groups. And there's a reason for that. It's because we get to surround ourselves with community. We build friendships. And so when we have these long, dark winter days, um, we have community and we have people and we can rally around one another and have laughter and friendship. And somehow that makes these long, dark days a little bit shorter. And in the middle of all that, like you get to see a different side of God and he challenges us in ways when we're around other believers that we never thought that we could be challenged before and we grow in ways that we never thought we could grow before. And so if you're on the fence, if you've thought about maybe joining a group, we have so many different options and kind of dep depending on what's going on in your life right now, you can find some a group there that's going to be able to meet one of those needs. And so just go ahead and check that out. That's in your program or they're online. You can check those out later. And if you would like to register, you can go to cedarhillschurch.com slash adult. We have an entire list out there and you register and you'll get all the information you need for that. So that's coming up. Also today, if you're one of the brave few who this is the very first time you've ever been to Cedar Hills and you decide to come in the middle of the winter ice storm, we love that you are here. Thank you so much for being here. Please fill out that connection card and let us know if you have any questions or any way that we can serve you. Also in the lobby afterwards, if you want to stop by that guest check-in table, we have a gift for you there. So we love that you're here online as well. Thanks so much for just checking us out here today. And um, then today, if you are giving back to God, um, you can always do that in the black boxes on your way out, or you can do that online as well. In a moment, we're going to be going through our series called Choose, and Doug is going to be taking us through that. Check out your screen. Try that again. Good morning. good morning. It is good to see you all here, smiling, happy, ready to go. 
Give us a big thumbs up if you're online. Let us know. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. So again, my name is Doug. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for entrusting me with this opportunity to share with you today. As you can see, our series is called Choose. Eric has done a great job already setting this up. He started talking to us about uh, fear and trust, the difference between those two, how trusting God is really what will help us to overcome fear. It doesn't make fear go away, but it gives us the opportunity to move through it so that we can uh, understand things as he does. Now, this is all with regard to how we live the whole of our life, but we're specifically focused on how our lives are affected by our way that we handle our budgets and our finances. And so part of this choose thing is all about how we handle what we've got. So that led us to the second in the series, which was about hoarding or giving. And Eric did, again, a really great job about how we have the opportunity to choose to live sacrificially, cheerfully, and consistently. And by doing so, it unlocks God's work in us, not because we have to do it, but because we get to do it. And then Eric kind of circled the wagons on that and, and is going to be putting out and has put out a challenge for us for 90 days to really ask God, what does he want us to do with what we've got? What is it that he would have us do with even our finances, our budgeting, all those different things? And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. What I really loved about it, though, was when Eric was talking about giving, you know, people just go, oh, gosh, now we're going to talk about this is the big gorilla swinging from the chandelier again. Eric says, look, we don't care what you do with your money, but that you give it back to God, whether you give it here at Cedar Hills or you give it to somewhere else. Just be willing to let go of what you think is yours and give it back to God. I really appreciated that. But then I got to thinking, um, now, if I'm going to do this 90 day challenge that Eric has talked about, what are some of the what are some of the bumps that I'm going to hit along the road? And really, those bumps have a lot more to do with what's going on inside of me. How am I actually going to do this? Anybody think that at all when Eric shared that? How am I actually going to live this out? Well, I came across a story, and it kind of helped me, so I'm going to share it with you real quick. A father gave his little girl $2, and he said, honey, you can do whatever you want with these $2, but I want you to know that one of those dollars belongs to God, and you can do whatever you want with the other dollar. She was all giddy. So with joy, she ran to the candy store. And on her way to the candy store, she tripped. And as she tripped, one of the dollars fell into the storm drain. And she looked down in it in a little bit of disappointment, looked up into the heavens and said, Well, Lord, there goes your dollar. We, we do laugh at a story like that, but I have to say, as I thought about it, the underlying issue is where I oftentimes get in trouble, where this story just illustrated, and that is this, where I get in trouble sometimes determining what is mine and what is God's. Who owns what? Is what I own really mine? So... This story that we're talking about today out of Matthew chapter 25, if you want to turn there, is all about that. It's all about who owns what, who manages what. Now, you may be familiar with the story that Jesus told. It's about three servants who got a bunch of money from their master. Now, some of you might be familiar with it. Others might not. But the teaching is, is designed to describe what it looks like to actually walk in the kingdom of God with Jesus. Okay, so the story, basically, I'm going to give you a quick summary, and then we're going to go through it, the whole story. It's basically about a guy that's got a lot of money. You might say he's a master, he's an employer, and he's got employees. He's got three of them in particular that he gives, he tells them, look, I'm going away on a trip. Here's some cash. Do with it what you think you should, okay? And then he goes away. Well, then, eventually, we find out what they did with the money, and then the master returns and calls them to account. And then in that accounting, that's where we enter into this story uh, in a moment. So let's start off with the very first part where the master tells him he's going away. So this is in uh, Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14. It says this, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Now, this word, uh, please bring that back. This word again, 
extremely important. Anytime you see a word that begins in a sentence in a verse in the Bible, and it says again, or it says therefore, that's usually referring to something that Jesus said before. Now, Jesus had said something before in Matthew chapter 23, and it was, you will not see me again until, okay, until you see the Son of God coming in the heavens. Okay, so again is kind of an idea that tells us a little bit about the context. Jesus is telling this story just before he's going to be crucified. And in this story, he's telling his disciples, I am going to go away, but then I will return. And when I return, I want to see that you are ready. That's the context of this particular story about the talents and about the servants. Again, we continue with this. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money. This is extremely important. He entrusted whose money? His money. He is the owner. So this whole story about this man or this master, maybe you've heard it before, really represents God. Who owns what? Well, we know that God owns everything. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture from Psalm 24, 1. The psalmist says it this way. <clears throat> he says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. God owns it all. Not just some of it. He owns all of it. We go to the other part of this verse where it says, <clears throat> the money was divided according to their abilities. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag to, of silver to the other, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he went on his trip. Now, we might think that's a little bit unfair. Why did he give more to one and less to the other? But it's not about what's fair and not fair. It is about the ability or the capacity of a person to do, it shows that the master actually knew his servants, what their capacity was to do with what he gave to them. So it's not about what's fair and not fair in this particular story. It is an indication, however, that it's his stuff <clears throat> that he gave to them and he divided it up, which means that if you are God's servant, you got something, no matter how much it is. Everybody gets something to do with. Does that make sense? So none of us have been shortchanged. Everybody's got something. Can, I, can, I, can you raise your hand? Everybody got something? Good. Put a thumbs up in the online. Very good. So not everybody has the same gifts, but everybody has been getting something. The interesting thing about this is, in this story, the master never tells his servants what to do with the money. He just gives it to them. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty generous. I mean, if my boss just gave me a bunch of money and said, hey, go do with it what you want. When I come back, I'll talk to you. I'm like, woohoo! Okay. <laughs> Hopefully I'm going to do something wise with it and not something particularly foolish. So how did the servants respond to this? Now, again, let's just look at this again. You've got a man who is basically an employer, and then you have servants who are like employees, Right? Again, represents God and those of us that are here today. Okay, Matthew 25, 16 through 18. What does it say? The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. How many of you would love to have that kind of return on your investment? Anybody? <clears throat> Especially for those who have lost money in their 401ks in the past. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Interesting response to the generosity of the master. And when it comes to being faithful with what God has entrusted us, and when I say with what he's entrusted us, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your house, the car, your spouse, your children, your job, everything that you have in this particular life, God has entrusted these things to you and to me. And a good first step to being faithful with what God has given to us 
is just to mind how we think. How do we actually think about that which we have? So let me give you an example. This came up in a financial class that Ron Denova and I were teaching. And um, we were talking about God owns it all. It's not mine. I'm just a manager of the, of the things that God has given to me. And I was driving down my drive, and I knew that my brakes were going out. And to fix the brakes on my vehicle, I mean, it was going to be very expensive. And then I started thinking, Lord, what do I do? What, what should I do with my money? How am I supposed to take care of this car that, that um, has got a brake job? What do I do with my car? And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, as I was going down the hill, all this happened in a split second, right? That's usually how it happens. I didn't hear an vo audible voice. But I had this one click in my mind. And the click was this. Whose money? Whose car? So as I was going down the hill, I said, okay, let's rephrase this, Lord. What I mean is, what do you want me to do with your car? How do you want me to take care of your car? What is the strategy with the money that you have given me to take care of it? Now, that might sound like it's something stupid, but just that little tweak changed my whole focus on who it belongs to. And then I've been steward. I'm a steward of that which has been given to me. The next good step to take, and this is probably the hardest one, is to actually give up my stuff. Anybody ever struggle with that? Giving up your stuff or what you think is your stuff? Yeah. It's really hard for me personally this is often what I look like in my life. When it comes to my family, when it comes to my cars, when it comes to my job, everything, it's like it's mine. And I hold it with clinch fix. Now, now, let me ask you, if you wanted to give me five bucks, how easy would it be for me to hold five bucks with my hands like this? I'm not in a position to receive. Opening my hands, though, now I'm in a position to receive. And not only to receive, but to give. So if I can just ask the Lord to help me in my thinking, if this is yours, will you help me open my hands so that I can receive everything that you want to give to me? And trust me, it's way more than what we deserve. And then to be able to give it, to give it back. Is this making sense at all? Yeah. Good. Well, then let's take those steps. <laughs> um, as we go through this, though, Let's go to this next part of the, the passage. Now, this is the longer part of the passage. I'm going to read through it. You've heard this story, but it's good for us to hear the whole context. Okay, so they made some money with what was given to them. Now, it says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate. I mean, this is the attitude of the master with his, gave him his money. The guy did something with it, and he says, let's celebrate. Another version says, enter into the joy or the happiness of your master. Right? So he's smiling, all grins. Okay. Now we got the other servant. Servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate. Let's party. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, wow, who, who doesn't want a boss like that? Well, then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I had to do it. You didn't. I was afraid I would lose your money. So... I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. How did the master reply to this? You wicked and lazy servant. 
If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops that I didn't cultivate, even though they belonged to me, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. This is a pretty tough parable, isn't it? Especially when we get to this last servant. This is yes. This is no, yeah. I wonder if it bothers us because, and I'll speak for myself, I more often identify with the one-talent man than with the five- or two-talent man. Would you agree? The one-talent man was just an ordinary person, a lot like us. Now, if you're like me when I first read this story, I don't really like the ending. I just have to admit it. I don't like the ending. I don't like how it feels. I was talking to Casey, and she goes, this doesn't feel fair. I don't like this story. Anybody ever feel this way, though, when you read this? Yeah, so, so you're hoping, okay, Doug, give us a different perspective, right? Because I'm stuck with it. I don't like it. Well, I'm going to leave that to Jesus. Hopefully I can help. Let me ask this. When you see five talent and two talent people, who it seems like they're just cruising through life. Life is pretty easy. And then you're left with the fact that you're just struggling to make ends meet. How does that make you feel? Do you ever feel inferior? Do you ever feel resentful? These are questions to ask because we're trying to get into what might be going on with this other servant. Another thing that is tough about the parable is that although the one-talent man did not do such a smart thing, we know that. Who goes and buries their money in the backyard? (laughs) The reality is he didn't steal the money. He didn't embezzle the money. He went and dug it up and gave it back to his master just the way that he received it. And so you can see why it's easy to feel like how, how fair is this really to take away what this guy had? And we're going to come back to that. But let me just ask a question, and this is a hypothetical question, I know. But what if the one talent man had invested his talent and lost it? What then? We're told he was afraid. It's not implied in the story, so I know it's not there, but I'm just asking the question just to get us to think a little bit. But I've never found a place in the Bible where it says that if you try and fail, God will condemn you. And yet, how often do we feel that way? If I try and I fail, God is going to be unhappy with me. I'll tell you why it doesn't say that. It's because... God never commands us to be successful. God only commands us to be faithful. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, we talked about just being faithful with what you have. God takes care of the rest. We're just called to start, not to finish. God takes care of the finish. And we see that even reflected in this story. Jesus oftentimes in his parables and in his stories uses money as an analogy to simply drive home the point that money represents anything in life that captures our hearts. Anything in life that we are more invested in and devoted to than to God himself. That's oftentimes the drive on these particular statements that are made. You might remember this scripture from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says this, Wherever your treasure is, There the desires of your heart will also be. Whatever you treasure most, that's what you will serve. Well, we have the first two servants. An example of what their heart was reflecting came out in their actions. They were invested in their master's objectives, which meant that they were totally invested in their master. As the master says and does, so we will say and do. And what did Jesus say about his father? Whatever I hear the father say, I say. Whatever I see the father do, I do. 
Even Jesus had that perspective. Well, that's the perspective of these two other servants. The idea of this is my dollar and this is God's dollar never entered their mind. All of it was their master's. Then we come to the third servant, again, who makes this parable incredibly difficult. His heart is also revealed by his actions. Do you remember how he started? If you can go back to this, to what the uh, other servant said in the scripture. If you can back that up, it'd be great. He basically said this. I knew you were a harsh man. And that you reaped and sowed which you did not plant. He begins his response to the master by accusing him of being harsh and unjust. He judged the motives and the objectives of his master. His perception of his master didn't match reality. The master who was generous in giving and didn't tell them what to do with it. He just was generous in giving. Which, by the way, this guy's livelihood, he lived on campus. He lived with his master. All of his life came from him. And yet, in spite of that, his perspective on his master was jaded. He saw him as harsh, not generous. He saw him as unfair. And it would appear, I don't know this is true, but it would appear that he was resentful of that. He became resentful of the fact that he didn't get to own it himself. It was his master's and not his. His way of thinking that his master was harsh was not only unfair and inaccurate, it caused him to be unprepared when his master showed up. And Jesus is just telling this story. So he says, look, I've given you the kingdom. I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Be watching for my return because I'm coming back. And make sure other people are ready as well. That's the point of this whole story. Extremely important. Let me just give um, an illustration because I believe that this story really isn't about currency. It's not about money. And it's really not about how to manage money well, although that is a biblical principle that um, we do want to learn. The main thrust of the story is recognition of source and gratitude toward the source and playing with the source, participating with the source, the owner. So let me just give you an illustration. We all know what this is, right? What is that? This is a ball. This is a soccer ball. What do you do with a soccer ball? You kick it, you throw it, right? And you just do it with yourself, right? Or do you give it to somebody? Look at the smile on her face. Isn't that great? Uh, so what are you going to do with it? Are you going to give it to somebody else? Make somebody else smile. Why not? Okay, and then where are you, what are you going to do with it? And then if I give Mary one, what is she going to do with it? <laughs> she just pass it to somebody else. And there you go. And so it goes. The balls go around. And it comes back. Now, I'm going to ask you, is there a mom or dad here who has ever given money to your children to buy you a present for Christmas? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, and so when you receive the gift from your child, it comes back to you, what do you do? Yeah, what was my money anyway? Who cares? Oh, stupid tie again? Another year? No, what do you do? You say, oh, this is beautiful. This is so amazing. This is so great. In other words, that parent is inviting the child into their joy, and yet they're the ones that gave them the money in the first place. This is the point of the story. God has called you and me to participate with him in his kingdom and to have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> hey, we almost got a header out of that one. That was awesome. Look at if, if I took this ball, can you give me the ball back for a second? 
that's cool. Okay, if I take this ball and I go out on the field and um, I've got it under my arm and all of all of the, uh, my teammates are out there on the sidelines, coach shows up. Coach says, what's going on? I just go, I don't know. Just, just hanging out. He goes, why aren't you guys playing? Because they don't want to. Well, why are you holding the ball? Oh, because I want it. And I like it. He says, well, why don't you give it to somebody else? I said, because I like the ball. Right? And what is the coach going to do? Oh, no problem. It's okay. Right? No, what's he going to do? He's going to take the ball from me, give it to somebody else, and go out and play and go say, now you go sit on the bench while we go play. Right? This is Jesus' point at the very end of the parable. This is the hard part that we read that we still need to read again and, and try to put all this in perspective from what's already been shared. What does this last part say in verses 28 and 30, through 30? The master ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm just going to ask you, please don't get hung up on the rewards and punishments that seem to be like, oh, that's so bad. That's what makes this story so hard. No, it doesn't. Let's not get hung up on that. Jesus is simply making a statement about reality. He's making a statement about the way that things are, not the way that we wish they would be. And that's what Jesus calls us into, is to live in reality, not in a pipe dream. We don't lose talents by investing them. We lose talents by burying them. And you know what? God is going to bless anybody who invests, even if in investing, we drop the ball, right? God doesn't care about whether we drop the ball or not. He just wants us to give it back. If there's any hope at the end of this story that we just read, the hope is this. If we're stuck, we don't need to stay stuck. If I find myself to be more like the unfaithful, one-talent man, I don't have to stay that way. I get to choose. I can choose to learn and ask God to help me to be the one that just wants to see a smile on somebody's face, <laughs> even if I miss, <laughs> or not. One of the cool things here at Cedar Hills that I have always loved about the leadership is that there's always this, this desire to invest in the people that are in the church. And one of those investments is this, that especially for those of us who might feel stuck, we want to help. We want to offer a way to give a boost, a way forward for those who need it. So one of the things that we have is FPU, and that's one of the things that's coming up in winter for you if you want to sign up for it. It costs 85 bucks. Did I say it costs 85 bucks? It's an $85 investment for a nine-week series, and it's led by Danny and Taggart Schoenrock, amazing lovers of Jesus, and really good with their money. Anyway, they are leading this Financial Peace University about getting unstuck and staying unstuck with regard to our finances and the things that cause us worry and affect the whole of our life. This is at Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. You can find it in the program if you want to know a little bit more, but it is a nine-week series of videos and practical steps on, fina on financial freedom. I will say to you, Casey and I went through this several years ago, and in the process, now this, ours was 13 weeks, so be glad, this is only nine. Okay, but in the 13 weeks, we got out of debt. We, we actually paid off $40,000 of debt because going through that particular course changed the way that we thought about our money. And it changed 
what we thought about debt. It really helped us, right? We found some freedom, not just financial, but we just found like, whew, that's not there anymore. Anybody like that? That's a practical way that the leadership wants to help. And by the way, if you finish the course after you sign up, you're going to get your money back because Cedar Hills, we don't care if 100 people do it. We're willing to give away 8500 bucks just to say that it helped so that you could walk in the kingdom as a good steward with Jesus. I think it's great. I want to end this by saying that the parable that we just read and the principle it change, that, it, that it teaches us hasn't changed for centuries, and it's never going to change. God is still the master who has entrusted himself. Jesus has entrusted himself to us. It says that he lives within us. The kingdom of the heavens is within us. And he just asks us, would you willingly participate with me in the kingdom? And again, as I said it earlier, you and I get to choose what we want to do with what we've been given. It's your choice to be the one who does well as a faithful servant of what God has given to you. It's also your and my choice to do nothing. One choice will result in celebration, enter into the joy of your master. The other one will simply be isolation and fear. Resentment. So, so where do we go from here? I would mentioned to you earlier that Eric put a 90-day challenge out to us. And that also is in your program. Has anybody looked at that, by the way? 90-day challenge? Okay. It is going to challenge you. It's going to challenge me. But I want to say that I believe it's worth the challenge because Cedar Hill started off as a one-talent church. But it's no longer a one-talent church. It's much more. God has given an increase. And do you know why? I believe that God has given an increase because people like you sitting here today have not been afraid. You have chosen to be bold instead to invest yourself in something bigger than yourself, which is the kingdom of God. It's caring about those who don't know Jesus. It's caring about those who are broken and lost. We proved it at Christmas. $46,000 was given, not to ourselves, but to others because of you. And, be, and Okay, not because you owned it, but because you stewarded. You threw the ball out in the field. You played. I see many people serving just in the coffee. I had a good coffee this morning, by the way. Anybody like coffee? Did you get some coffee, some tea? That happened because somebody was willing to serve me and to serve you in this community that is also part of giving that which has been given to us our time and our effort what a blessing do we have that 90 day challenge up where we can choose for the next 90 days to be sacrificial to be cheerful and consistent in our giving the choice is yours. But you need to choose. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, all you heavenly hosts. Praise him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Lord bless you with all that he has given you. And may it return with a tremendous amount of joy as you experience the abundance of God. Amen? Amen. Now, I know that we're a little bit early. So if you want, fill out that 90-day challenge. You have time. You've got five minutes before you go pick up your kids. I'm so grateful to be with you here today. And I'm so grateful that we are here to expand the kingdom in our community. Bless you.